Welcome. Okay, let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Um, good evening. My name is Michael White. I'm a programming librarian at the Glenview Public Library. And on behalf of Neil and our partner at the Arlington Heights Memorial Library, we'd like to welcome you to tonight's program. We're so happy that you're here, and we hope that you'll keep us in mind and join us for future music and book programs. We've got a couple of ideas in the works already for fall. Um, so stay tuned to your library's website and social media for more info. Jen Larson's um, book, Hit Girls, Women of Punk in the USA, 1975 to 1983, is the story of nearly 100 regional American bands who shattered stereotypes and eardrums. Women were in punk bands in every city, in every scene, and Jen's book does an amazing job of positioning their achievement that blazed the way for a generation of women rockers. It's really inspiring stuff, and we're honored that she's here tonight to talk about the book. We're going to put a link in the chat at the, uh, of the, of the uh, event so that you can pick up a copy of the book. We also encourage you, your, your libraries have copies of the book. Um, please check it out at your local library. I want to take a quick second to um, thank Christina Ward at Feral House, Jen's publisher. Um, she's been super supportive of libraries and this programming. Um, we're grateful for the opportunity to collaborate on this work. With that, I'd love to uh, introduce tonight's guests. Jen B. Larson is a writer and musician who teaches special education at a public art school in Chicago. She holds a BA in English literature and creative writing as well as an MED in special education. Her band Swimsuit Edition, Beastie, and Jen and the Dots have performed and recorded extensively over the last decade. Todd Novak is co-founded Hozak Records in 2006 and Hozak Books in 2014, and we're really glad they're both here tonight. Um, thank you, Jen and Todd. I'll turn it over to you. All right. How's it going, Jen? Pretty good. How are you? Great. Thank you for meeting up with me today for this. Yeah. And congratulations on your first book. Thank you. I'm so glad to see it finally made it out. And it, isn't it really great to hold it in your hands for the first time? Yeah, it's exciting. I, I know, know it really is. <laughs> but I admit, it feels really good, too. You got to have books that feel good. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. But um, yeah, so we had a lot of fun uh, the last couple of years, like, uh, running into each other out at shows and at uh, bars and stuff like that and talking about music. And uh, yeah, we were just chatting about how we first got to know each other and you were starting out writing. Um, you wrote some a couple things for Please Kill Me, I believe, and Victim of Time back in... What, what, what year did you do the Please Kill Me writing? You know, the Please Kill Me stuff actually came after um, the book was set to to be written. Oh, so, okay. Uh, Victim of Time, other than my personal blog, I think Victim of Time was the first time that I really wrote anything about music in the last 10 years anyway. Okay. So yeah, you gave me that's an opportunity to write about some of the, the stuff that went into my book. First. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think it was right around, uh, we saw Nikki Corvette at East Room, I believe, like right around 2018, something yeah. like that. that. That sounds about right too. Well, very yeah. cool. Awesome. Well, so uh, when you were, you know, getting the whole grand idea for your book together, uh, some of the, you know, the the big like things that loom over it are like, what was your first vision of punk when you were growing up? Um, what was the first thing you saw that you were like, OK, that's like that's punk. So I think when I was really, really little, um, my my siblings uh, were both Gen X. Um, mm -hmm. so they're like 10 years older than me. And so it was like a five, you know, six year old, they had MTV on in the background. Okay. I think, you know, I saw some Beavis and Butthead. I saw, uh, <laughs> I saw, you know, the videos that they were playing. Um, I very vividly remember, uh, the band named the butthole surfers because I thought it was very bad and very funny. Um, but I think before that, when I was really little, I was really obsessed with the Muppets. Yeah. And I think subconsciously the Muppets are probably my first vision of punk. 
that makes total sense. And I think we talked about this too. Debbie Harry was on the Muppets. Like she totally could have been on one of the episodes you saw and you would have been like, wait, you know, 10 years later, you're like, I've, I recognize her from somewhere or something. So yeah, those types of true. I think that that happened. And something really funny is I went back to, I, I vividly remember um, Shiny Happy People, the REM song being on the Muppets. And I went back and watched it and Kate Pearson is actually in the video. So there's another subconscious uh, punk lady. That's true. Yeah, that's right. Oh my God, it's so crazy. I forgot that she was in that video, but you're right. Um, well, yeah, so, uh, you know, going back to the the origin stuff, um, you know, who would you consider to be like the um, the godmother of punk? Um, the godmother. So I have a lot of answers to this question. Um, you know, I think, you know, Big Mama Thornton, who is the godmother of rock and roll is inevitably the god, you know, one of the, I don't know, what the what the title would be pillar you know so she's one of the godmothers um her her vocal her vocal delivery her raw growl i think mm -hmm. um along with tina turner's voice and Hello, tina turner's yeah. dancing um i think we're all precursors to to punk um we have you know for guitar we have sister rosetta tharp who uh her distorted guitar sound her like first you know mm -hmm chord um Drone and distortion yeah yeah so we got that and then we have you know your grace slick yeah food uh her lifestyle was was godmotherly of punk mm -hmm. um, she was pretty offense she definitely was a shocker yeah trying to shock sure. people and it's still mind-blowing that white rabbit was like a top 10 uh like hit record in america it's so crazy to me but yeah totally what what year was that? I would say like 67. 67. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's just the fact that it was a, 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 you know, you could hear it in the grocery store or something is, it still sounds too jarring to be a pop culture, you know, embraced by pop culture. But I guess yeah. that shows everybody's heads were. Yeah. I, uh, when I was in middle school, I was really obsessed with the, the book, Go Ask Alice, the diary. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that that's, that's how I learned about that song. Great. Yeah, any other examples you can think of? Um we got Yoko Ono. Yep. Um definitely. she's experimental and she didn't really care what the haters thought. Right. Um, yeah, Yoko had some amazing <laughs> early tracks that a lot of people don't know about. There's a lot of Yoko haters out there who just haven't heard the good Yoko stuff, I'm convinced. So yeah, people have no idea. Mm -hmm. Um I just think that she broke up the Beatles. <laughs> um <laughs> Susie Quattro. Yes. Susie's um, a Seems like Susie's bigger than she gets credit for when you yeah. really look back. Like Susie's that bridge type proto punk punk era glam in there too. Like mm -hmm. just incredible that she was able to kind of like do so many different like eras and still have this amazing career. Yeah. And I think that maybe she's more respected outside of the US too. Yeah. That in a lot sense. of ways. Yep. Which I think Patty Smith has also said the same, like that she has you know, that people recognize her on the street in, in like Paris and, you know, different countries more so than they do in the U S which is wild. Yeah. That's pretty um, sad. Patty, obviously. Um, I think yeah. a lot of people say Patty is the godmother of punk. And I think she's the direct influence. Mm -hmm. Like I think that makes her a prime candidate. Um, I think so many women in the book, um, that I spoke with cited Patty as an mm -hmm. inspiration to them. Like, Right. Like, just seeing Patty Smith made them realize like, oh my God, I can do this or I want to do this. So yeah. I think she's really important. And she did a whole national tour a year before the Ramones did. So that is definitely, yeah. and like I told you, my first vision of punk was seeing Gilda Radner aping Patty Smith on Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live oh. in 1979 as Candy Slice and the Slicers. So I remember I did I hadn't heard of Patty Smith, but that was my little bridge there. So I'm glad that you know she was big enough to be mocked on Saturday Night Live by one of the biggest comedians in the world at that time. So and I don't even think Patty Smith drinks really. So Candy yeah. is supposed to like the yeah yeah exactly because Candy Slice was supposed to be all drunk and out of her mind. Yeah, you're right. Are we able to ask the audience? Um, I guess either of these questions. 
Uh, yeah. So what do we want to start with the first one? Sure. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah. What was your, what was your first vision of punk or Neil, are we, are we able to do a poll? There we go. All right. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, your sister also had a jacket in high school that had the sex pistols written on the back in marker. Yeah. I didn't, um, I didn't know about that until I was like looking through pictures and I was like, what? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, she had a really, she had really eclectic taste. Um, my sister, for those of you who don't know, um, I wrote about her a bit in my intro. She passed away when I was nine. She was 22. She was older than me. Um, but she had like made me mixtapes when I was a kid. And I remember, I remember REM a lot, but like, that wasn't all she liked. Like I found some of her mixtapes later and she was into, she had Nirvana and she had Tom Waits and she was just wow. into a lot of, a lot of really, really cool stuff. But yeah, I didn't know that she was into the Sex Pistols that, that <laughs> that's I ever found out until later. <laughs> yeah, that was probably, you know, there was an 80s wave of Sex Pistols fandom that kind of came after, I guess, the Sid and Nancy movie came out. If yeah. You know, the weird context as to why kids in like 1987, 88, all of a sudden were into the Sex Pistols, like 10 years after they were over. It's got to be because of that movie, because Gary Oldham, uh, you know, that was actually kind of a it was a popular film. So I can remember kids in high school, you know, renting it at sleepovers and stuff like that. So that was that era, you know, when yeah. even though it was like, you know, definitely R.E.M. was like you're like, how can someone be into Sex Pistols and R.E.M. at the same time? Those are two like completely different eras you know but that's I think that's kind of why because I remember seeing a bunch of kids like that that era too it's got to be that movie makes sense yeah, for sure for sure mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense um so we have Blondie the Clash happy is Susie Quattro on happy days see like for me a lot of it was like media stuff like I was like this it's goofy but you know the Beavis and Butthead stuff or like mm -hmm. Roger Klotz on Doug just wearing his leather jacket animal you know in the muppets animal like, yep goofy stuff like that wendy o chainsong tvs wendy o was like on some talk shows too. oh like, yeah christina mentioned like, the, the ramones were on the shauna na show i <laughs> forgot about that that was i mean that's a little I, I don't know if that would have been outside of new york wait was the shauna na show like nationally syndicated i don't really remember but i know they had a tv show somehow Oh, wow. Eric Davidson saw it in Cleveland. There we go. Yeah. Okay. And Eric also said that R.E.M.'s uh, first single came out only four years after Nevermind the Blog. So it's, yeah. It's yeah, that is kind of crazy. That does make sense. And Tina from Barbie Army. Hi. Uh, my first <laughs> email uh, punk experience is watching the B-52 as an SNL. See, like, I feel like SNL and the Muppets, like, I feel like they, I don't know. They just, they were a, a a good place well also uh patty patty was on snl in 75 we just watched that recently because i've got the box set the uh the first season of snl box set which took forever to come out because they couldn't get all the music clearance but yeah th there's a patty ep uh, an episode with her on it from 75 so that was you know broadcast right into every home in the country so, I need to watch, yeah. I need to watch. patty probably had the biggest like broadest step like at the time whereas Susie was a little earlier Everyone else was just directly, you know, an influence, but not exactly tied to it. But yeah, that seems like kind of like a pretty yeah. solid path too. But yeah, there was, I, uh, did you ever see the um, Decline of Western Civilization movie like on TV as a kid? No, not on TV. Um, I, I probably saw, yeah, I probably saw it around like 2007, 2008. Okay. That was around the era that I, you know, I read Please Kill Me and we got the new term bomb. And like, I did, I really, I truly didn't understand the history of punk um, until I was exposed to those, that media. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I didn't like, I didn't even understand that Patti Smith was punk necessarily. Like I kind of put her in this place where like I put Velvet Underground or like television. Like I knew they were like after kind of like the sixties hippie stuff. Mm -hmm. like, I you know, I didn't, I didn't really necessarily understand that Patty yeah. Smith was so punk. But like I said, like most, not most, but a lot of the women that I talked to, like the two bands that came up the most that influenced them were the Ramones and Patty Smith. Like yeah. people were just like, and I think, I think Bill, Bill Cop said something in the uh, Disturbing the Peace book where he said that the Ramones were like the Johnny Appleseed. They punk. really were. Yeah. Um, I think Patty Smith is a, is a Johnny Appleseed of, as well. 
<laughs> yeah, that's why I think it'd be really interesting to like look over Patti Smith's first U.S. tour and see all the bands that she played with and all these, you know, like in Portland or something. Who was the band that opened for Patti Smith and on her 75 tour? Like there could be some really great bands out there that just kind of slipped through the cracks just because of that, mm -hmm. um, because they were just too early, too ahead of the curve. But yeah, it's usually like, you know, whenever you hear about like bands like New York Dolls, you're like, oh, my God, that must have gone over like crazy. No one ever looked like that. And then you hear like, oh, wow, there were a couple other bands. So it's always like, you know, as time goes on, more of that stuff comes to the surface. But um, but yeah, uh, Fear on SNL, that was a big one, too, of course. Uh, but, you know, back to the uh, Decline in Western Civilization movie, I remember seeing that in high school and being really afraid of Alice Bag. <laughs> she was like really intimidating like in that in the the footage like her teeth looked like yeah. she had like like dracula teeth i remember being being like really scared of her which probably it, made me like the music even more yeah that's funny like um i think that was right after they broke up and so she was probably really extra angry mm -hmm. yeah because um, it was the alice bag band yeah, yeah you're right yeah and um i was gonna say i think that because of like sid and nancy and even because of just kind of visions of mm -hmm things from the decline of western civilization i kind of thought of punk as like this druggy culture yeah it was it, was. it, it really that's why it was so disorienting in the 80s to see punk be like the straight edge thing too which was obviously like the backlash to that and it really didn't seem like the punk of the 70s and the punk of like the 80s when i was just kind of learning what punk was and growing up skateboarding and stuff it didn't seem like those worlds ever intersected like they were just completely different and they kind of really were it seems like but um yeah so uh the uh do you want to do another poll question now or oh yeah the godmother of punk yeah well no i guess yeah i was gonna say yeah we're gonna have that one just be a poll sure okay um i think the poll is just the people in the chat right yeah mm -hmm. so yeah, who would you say is the godmother of punk? I threw out a bunch of different um, ideas that I had because I, I can't name one person. <laughs> Todd, what do you yeah, think? I, yeah, I was going to say, I uh, I think it's a toss up between several, just kind of like how it always is with anything you try to pin on one person. It's It's just always hard, something that big, but I think, you know, people like Susie Quattro, who like were were in a bands in the 60s and in bands in the 70s, but yet kind of like faded from mainstream popularity in the like the mid 80s, I guess they uh, she's she like bridges those worlds. But then again, Tina Turner obviously was like in the 50s and Sister Rosetta Tharp goes back, but they they weren't as connected to like whereas Susie Quattro could have easily played with the Clash. Sure. you know but you know those those worlds like we're a little close to inter closer to intersecting but um <laughs> but yeah oh yeah some uh someone mentioned suburbia looks like yeah that was definitely one that played on television a lot um did you ever see suburbia as a kid i don't which one is that it's a it's penelope spheris film it came after uh it was like i think 1983 Okay. I don't know why I'm thinking of a movie with like Tom Hanks. Hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, not really. Someone probably knows what I'm talking about. I'm Could just... be. There's lots of like amazing 80s films. Verbs. Okay. Verbs. Okay. Verbs. Totally different. That I need to watch sense. Suburbia. Yeah. Suburbia is worth a watch. It's I want to say it's got uh Flea from Red Hot Chili Peppers in it. He's just some like punk kid who, you know, is hanging out at the at the punk house or whatever. But uh, but yeah, so uh, but oh, yeah, the Shags. Good one, too. The Shags are like the atonal champions of atonal pop music. So they've they've got their own uh, their own thing going, of course. But um, but yeah, there's there's so many good ones. It's uh, I mean, also like Shocking Blue is, you know, they were dark and and uh psychedelic as well um and what about that band tarantula i played you the video for on saturday but that lady sounded like she had a rattlesnake coming out of her throat <laughs> they were just they're just you know this prog band that you know obviously just had a crazy singer yeah it's really cool no i think i have seen uh suburbia before but i i think it was one of those things where i was watching it with a group of people gotcha long, yeah long it's 
it's it's not like an amazing movie or anything, but it's it's just one that kind of played on television a lot. Yeah, it, it's like thing. one of those. I feel like this is like that visual. It's the same, similar to Sid and Nancy or, uh, or the decline of Western civilization, where it's just like I just thought they were just like a bunch of like kids doing drugs and doing bad stuff, and they freaked me out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. Um. Oh yeah. Well, Debbie Harry of Blondie. Yep. I guess I didn't mention Debbie. Um, but yeah. And speaking of Debbie, like, you know, the stilettos, this, that Elda stiletto article that just came out, Elda seems like she could be like in that camp as well. She's like a real interesting figure. So hopefully there'll be more light shed on her too. Cause she's, she was the brainchild behind the stilettos, I guess, but trying to figure out the, the rest of that story. But, uh, but um, I feel like yeah, and I feel like it's important to note that like the godmother of a genre or whatever has to be somebody who who was really influential too. You right, know, exactly. I feel like mm -hmm. like that's an important thing that everybody's kind of That's true. So doing. Patty, Patty and Susie and they're a little more in the influential part probably um considering how many people were influenced by the band Susie influenced. Yeah. In a way too, but um, should we move on to the next one? The uh, of the original female fronted bands of the 70s, both New York and LA, have the honor of having their flagship bands still active today. Yeah, and bigger audiences than ever before. Patty Smith, Lydia Lunch, Blondie in New York, and X and the Go Go's in LA. Of the longest running female fronted bands on this level, which is your favorite? Um. Or you can pick a favorite per city if you want. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting. Um, so yeah, thinking about New York, like uh, I've seen Retrovirus, uh, Lydia Lunch's band a few times in the last few years. And I think they're pretty mind blowing to mm -hmm. see live. Um, you know, she has this way of getting the, her bands to play like her subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And so it's both like terrifying and incredible um, mm -hmm. and moving to see. Um, I've seen, you know, Patti Smith, another New York artist in Chicago, near where she was born, actually, because I think I saw her at uh, Riot Fest a few years ago. And that was, she, she opened for Bikini Kill, which I thought was interesting. It was like, oh, she was wow. setting the stage for Bikini Kill. That's, that um, is kind of crazy. <laughs> but that was, that was a mind-blowing show. Um, I've seen the B-52s, mm -hmm. which is just fun and great. And you know, thrilling. Um, Have you ever seen Go Go's? I haven't, and I was gonna say they're probably the one that's the hardest to see. Really, I guess. In I mean, they don't. I you know, I was kind of surprised they didn't tour after their documentary came out. Yeah, Where'd it they would have been really a good time to do it, but you know, Las Vegas or something. Yeah, they played a couple. Yeah, San Diego, um, I think. I feel like I would travel to see them because I would. I was gonna say I actually think they're my favorite. Um, Mm -hmm. for the nostalgia factor and just because i'm a sucker for power pop mm -hmm. um, i love the avengers too eric <laughs> i'm gonna yeah. see that the most with meltdown so i'm really excited about that yep avengers are still great for sure they played our very last blackout festival that was they were the last band of the last one that was pretty exciting was that the bottle yeah mm -hmm. that was a uh, 2017 i think yeah or 2015 yeah Penelope Houston's picture on Wikipedia is of her playing at the Abbey pub the last I yeah the last I checked anyway I thought that was pretty cool it's a Chicago and th was that an Avengers show or just her solo I don't know I it looks Avenger like an Avengers set uh, the picture it might say I'm not sure I could look it up okay gotcha yeah. <laughs> oh yeah uh how did you decide which bands to include Christina was asking Ooh. Um, <laughs> you just kind of um, narrow it down per per region after like a master list or so I, I've been making lists of bands for a while like since I started just thinking about how many women were playing punk music mm -hmm. um, you know it, I don't know if you had given me the Merry Monday record before this or if you had given it to me because I was talking to you about this I'm not sure but like I've just been like obsessively making lists for a while and the lists are out of control. So um, 
in order to narrow it down, like it was originally, I think it'd be a hundred ended up being 89, I believe. But I, I think what I, I didn't want to write a book about Patty Smith and the Go-Go's and, you know, yeah. Gordon and the Runaways and Debbie Harry and just be like, oh, remember these four women who played punk music? I wanted to, um, I wanted there to be documentation of, you know, they're the tip of the iceberg and I wanted there to be documentation of like what's below the surface. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I thought about visibility and I wanted it to be bands that were less visible. Oh and yeah, absolutely. Always a better idea. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then there's, there, I mean, there are a lot of things. So then it was like, it was that, and then sort of the access to information, like, could I interview somebody? Could I talk to somebody in this band? Or is there, is there writing on them that I can find or get a hold of? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I wanted to think about the leadership of the band. Was there a woman that was a leader, like had a leadership role in the band? So a lot of times that sort of um, decided whether or not you included them. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. So like a lot of like singers and good, there's a lot more singers and guitarists than there are like drummers and bassists with male singers. Um, not that that didn't mean they don't have a leadership role, but I was right. I was trying to look, find things that were like kind of like female forward. Yeah, I didn't realize that band, the accident, the Kill the Bee Gees accident band. I didn't realize they had three different female lead singers. Yeah, kind and of. I just... knew that I knew that Sado Nation had two different female mm -hmm. singers, but it is weird how some of those bands were like, no, we just have to have another female singer. Yeah. So like, obviously, she wasn't in charge if she was if she quit and someone else replaced her uh, or maybe she was. Uh, but yeah, but either way, it kind of seemed like there were a couple of those bands that had multiple singers. And then that that there, what is it? Isn't it like the Berlin was like that, too, I think. Or um, uh, a couple of those other like bands had, you know, several different singers. Yeah. And like different bands had different reasons for that. Like sometimes it was just like they wanted the tonality, you know, of a mm -hmm. female voice. Or I think with Sado Nation, they, you know, they talked about they wanted the perspective of a woman um mm -hmm. in, you know in the lyric writing um with uh the accident that was a funny one because there kind of were just two singers the like the third one who was actually the first one mm -hmm. the reason she just like went she ended up playing their first few shows with them because the singer wasn't available and so she wow. was just a, a friend of theirs that, like went on this you know their first tour with them and then was like okay you know i'm just i'm just sitting in for the person who hasn't even that's played so funny um <clears throat> But like they replaced both a guitarist and a singer at the same time. And the 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 second two, uh, uh, Lisa and Doug, were they ended up getting married and they're like still married and everything. OK, well, great. Well, yeah, uh, I was gonna say that's, that's some I did not know that. So it was good to good to always learn some stuff every time you pick up a new book. So that definitely uh, was cool. Should we uh, premiere a Merry Monday track? Yeah. We do have some Merry Monday unreleased demos that uh, your book was able to unearth. Um, when I posted the photo of your book on our Instagram page, Paul Collins from The Nerves and The Beat, I'll just fill everybody in here. He saw the post and said, whoa, Merry Monday. I used to be great friends with her. I have a demo tape of hers from 1976. And I immediately sent him a message saying, can we hear that? Can you transfer it over? And he, within hours, he'd sent over this completely unearthed 1976 Merry Monday demo tape with three tracks. But uh, so make a long story short, I reached out to Mary's daughter and asked her if there was we had her permission to release them and make her the uh, executor of the project. And she agreed that was OK. So we were we've got these three tracks to share today, which are a world premiere. So should we do one? Yeah. All right. What's the first one? Um, thanks, kids. Thanks, kids. Sounds like it should be the last one. <laughs> should we do it last? Uh, whatever you want to do. However, they whatever. Okay. I'll, 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 okay. My favorite one is I hate daytime. So, okay. Let's do that one. I love that one. That's my favorite. It's a great one. And if you if you uh, enjoy the night and thank the Lord for the nighttime, <laughs> it's a great one. Yeah. Um, well, all right. So uh, let's move along to the next question, shall we? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, it wasn't just Jane County that was outgrossing everyone in the 70s. Um, when it comes to majorly offensive punk music from this era that your book covers, Teddy and the Frat Girls is near the top of the heap. 
as well as the nuns. How do you think those bands went over then? And how would you expect them to be accepted if in the modern music climate? So, yeah, this question has a lot of layers, um, I think. Um, you know, embedded in the nature of punk music is the idea of pushing boundaries. Right. Um, so there's like boundaries that people are pushing that are just like against conservative lifestyles, you know, gender roles and dress codes and acceptable haircuts and art and acceptable ways that music can sound and things like that. Um, and then there's stuff that's like provocative and maybe taboo, like even like Lydia Lunch, you know, writing about abuse or having a band even just call themselves the clits or bitch, mm -hmm. right? Um, which couldn't be displayed on marquees in their respective right, city. Yeah. <laughs> or like in the newspaper. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think some of those things, some of those things would be, you know, most of those things would be celebrated, you know, today. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the stuff that Jane County did bring out a toilet and things like that. Like, I think that yeah. that's the thing that would, you, you know, you'd have an audience for that kind of thing. Um, you know, like, so if we're on a spectrum here, then we get into like more, uh, more offensive territory, like Teddy and the frat girls, um, whose name in and of itself is pretty vile. Um, I never knew it was a reference to Ted Bundy until your yeah. I had no I idea. You told, I actually thought you told me that, that their yeah, name was yeah. originally Ted Bundy and the frat girls. Maybe you didn't tell me that. I just no. I was going to say, but that totally makes <laughs> sense because it, I, that yeah, you must have read that somewhere. Because, mm -hmm. um, but either way, it, it's uh, that that was pretty interesting. And um, we did that compilation that was Cincinnati based a couple of years ago, and they were on that. And that always kind of confused me that they were on that. But yeah, they moved, I guess, from Florida. But uh, but yeah, they're they're definitely like got to be one of the toughest listens of all the bands in your book. Um, it's still, yeah, it's still yeah. nothing you can really DJ out or anything. It's, it's kind of sucks yeah. the air out of the room in, in a way, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah. And so they had like gross, super gross lyrics. I put some of the lyrics in the book. I, yeah, I'm surprised you did. <laughs> I yeah. know I was like, I was kind of like, wow, you didn't have to do that, but yeah, there you go. Well, I think documenting it. Yeah. Got to let them know what they're getting into. It's definitely some toilet humor of, yeah. know, to put it mildly. They sang Alephin Baby, that song, that's a yeah. laxative, Alephin. Yeah, Alephin was a laxative. I don't know if it's any around anymore, but it was a laxative. Yeah. <laughs> so they sing about just- My heart to toilet brush. Yeah. <laughs> that's still a very romantic thing to say, though. Yeah. So I think that that kind of stuff is like shock art, trans transgressive, like the way that, you know, Wendy O. Williams, you know, smashing TVs and chainsawing things, you know, she was all against consumerism and things like that. Mm -hmm. scatological humor type I, I i think that there is an audience for that kind of stuff i do yeah, little kids no, <laughs> they no, love it kids. they they literally do yeah that's, <laughs> like, that's probably it's that's it's big true. market is little kids stealing a tape of it or something you know yeah i'm thinking it's really funny but right. then it's like then you have offensive stuff like the nuns um, yeah the nuns i remember when i first heard like you know decadent jew single i was kind of just blown away and then when i saw that the band was like you know mostly people of color and a woman I was just like wow this is even even more off the charts but yeah it's still and then you realize like as time goes on you read more about it you're like okay this is like they're basically taking the piss out of like you know um who was the guy that uh that ran uh the Winterland and the Fillmore East Bill Graham oh, and because like it, it, you know, the fact that like bands like that couldn't play Winterland and stuff like that, it was only for the Sex Pistols show. But you know, the big the big venues wouldn't allow bands like that. They were they couldn't like play bigger places than the Whiskey in 1978 or something like that. The Troubadour, yeah, like like that, yeah that that song like even they had consequences at the time. You yeah, know, I'm that. sure they definitely were. <laughs> I mean, it's on their like demos they did for CBS where you can imagine someone just going, what? You're going to really like try to put this on as a demo? But um, yeah. I think Bill Graham wanted to manage them, but like asked them to get rid of that song. And they were like, no. And they ruined, you know, they ruined that relationship. So they like sabotaged themselves by, you know, wanting to. Yeah. Playing it. They definitely could have been the first West Coast punk band with an album if all of would have gone well for them. That that CBS yeah. demos uh, LP from 1977 is really 
amazing. It's just, uh, you know, of course, just had to come out as a bootleg, though. So, yeah, that's how it goes. But, um, uh, oh, any, uh, let's see, moving on to the next question. How did you decide on the book title and what other ideas missed the cut? Um, so Hit Girls, I think we were throwing some ideas, different ideas. I knew I wanted it to be a song title. Mm -hmm. um, that was that was something I knew needed to happen. Um, That's usually a good idea. I think that especially I, if it's a yeah, you know if it agree. encapsulates the concept of the book and everything too. So I'm just wondering what other what other like contenders you had. Um, I think the first thing I was calling it was "You're Gonna Die" because I was obsessed with that the, song? Uh, the Destroy All Monsters song and. Yeah. Christina and Jessica didn't like it, but I don't know if it was also because they have another, maybe Christina can answer this, they have another title that's really similar, but also I don't, I don't think that would have been a good title. So I'm glad they didn't like it. Yeah, uh, it doesn't encapsulate like the concept of the book, like you kind of would like yeah. it, sure, but. I think I was thinking like it's to die for or something, I don't, it doesn't make sense, but I think <laughs> the girls is perfect. I think I had some other ideas that were like, I owe it to the girls was one of them, which. Yeah, really that would have been a great one. Yeah. yeah. Um, definitely, uh, and that's Teddy and the Frat Girls for people that don't know out there. Yeah, I think awesome. that's an act of gratitude. I think the whole book is an act of gratitude in a lot of ways. So um, Hit Girls stuck, though, because there are a couple of reasons. Um, the lyrics um, resonate with themes of the book. Um, I think that, you know, the themes of unity and that women are self-made and are able to overcome obstacles while, while forging a path are all in that song. And then I also think that, you know, Christina and I both have a bias toward the Midwest a little bit and the Amadots are from uh, Milwaukee. So I think that it was, I think those are two of the that major. Makes sense. It's also just, I think it's a good, it's a good book. Movie. Yeah, it totally does. That's true. <laughs> that is true. That is absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, um, the Gigi Allen, Gigi Allen was another scatological. Narrative. Oh yeah, I was, we were replying to this question here uh, from T. Marie Matlock, but yeah, the uh, there is an actually a really excellent podcast on the origins of G.G. Allen and how he turned into the bad G.G. Allen, and it's so bizarrely squarely put upon Jane County, like yeah. he apparently like worshipped Jane County, and there's like photos of him in Jane County T-shirts and stuff, and he just he 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 fell into toilet rock like way more than Jane County could have ever imagined, so. <laughs> I wonder, I would love to hear Jane County's like inner, like her <laughs> uh, feedback on how, hey, did you ever think that this would happen? Like creating a monster, but you know, obviously she didn't make him do it or anything, but it's interesting how she was a huge influence on him or the, or the toilet rock era of Jane. Um, but yeah, pretty amazing stuff there. That's for sure. But uh, okay. So uh, should we do another Merry Monday premiere? 745, yeah. we're getting kind of up there. Yeah, let's do All one right. more. Let's what do should one more. we do? Uh, uh, I love, I the, love beat. the beat. Yeah, James. let's do it. I love the beat. And uh, apparently when Mary Monday gave Paul Collins this tape, she saw him uh, like a few months after the beat had got signed in 1979 and said something along the lines of, did you name your band after that song that I had on my demo? And I was just, so yeah, that that's pretty funny too, because you know, they're who knows. But I'm sure Paul just wanted to really just have a shortened version of the name Beatles, which is yeah. the reason. Can't hurt, you know. There's always that, a guitar solo in every one of these the bitches <laughs> songs. Yeah, exactly. They had to they had to rip it up. Well, they were probably still wearing flares. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so moving on here. Wow, we're getting low on time already. This is crazy. Um, what do you consider the first self-released independent female-fronted punk record of the original wave? Patti Smith Group's Hey Joe, Piss Factory single from 74 or Mary Monday's debut? So I think they're both, quote unquote, the first punk album for different reasons. I mean... Patty being a poet, Mary more of a performer, like a mm -hmm. cabaret performer. Um, they did totally different things with punk, you know, yeah, or exactly. with in, inspired people in different ways. So I think that's what's interesting about punk is that people in bands aren't all punk in the same way. Right. Like, 
people exactly. are punk. and when punk got you know when when it, there became a uniform and it became like this one way of thinking or the, these are the only bands you could like that's when it became like unpunk yeah um, exactly so yeah that's, what do you think I, I definitely agree. I was actually just in Reckless today and there was some event uh, for like an in-store signing and Dan, my friend behind the counter, looked at me and was like, I think you're the only one in here that doesn't have their hair dyed. And I was like, wow. And I was in and out, but that kind of just stuck with me for the rest of the day. <laughs> you're the punch like hundreds of teenagers <laughs> and like, I was like, whoa, I'm like, that's the way to stick out now is to not have your hair dyed. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I totally agree. I think Patty and mary both hold it down i think they're they're the east and west coast equivalents it seems like for that i'd yeah. say that's a pretty good answer yeah um, um but yeah uh let's go through a couple of these last questions here um it's 1979 and you've been given the chance to book your choice of five current bands for a fundraiser event with cost being no barrier which bands would you pick <laughs> um Okay, so it's a fundraiser. You could fly um, bands in from anywhere in the world. So, yeah. yeah. It, they have to be bands that make people dance. And I'm just going to pick bands with women in them because that's what I want to do. So it's going to be the B-52s, Go-Go's. And you, you want popular bands because you need to make money. Bands that were just at least playing. It doesn't matter. It can be a very obscure band. It definitely doesn't have anything. All no right, my obscure one then is the Delinquents from Austin. Okay. Um, they, I don't, they, they remind me a lot of the B-52s. Um, X-ray specs would be there and ESG. Okay. Good one. Um, do you, I think it's seven fifty. So should, I think, um, they wanted us to do Q and a kind of at this time. Okay. That's, that's totally fine too. Is that what you wanted us to do? Yeah. Yeah. We'd love a little <laughs> bit of Q and a, I think. Thank okay. you so much, Jen and Todd. God, we, you know, time flies because this is just amazing conversation and we're just, uh, hanging out, listening in. It's amazing. So thank you. Let yeah, me we didn't even uh, get to our top sax tracks. I know, I know. We, we could do an article. We spent so much time working on that, too. <laughs> <laughs> we, could, we could squeeze it in if we, if we can get these people to stick around for a few minutes. Okay. So Jen, Jen um, can just read them off at the end. That's totally fine. Yeah. Let's do it. Um, so Whitney's um, asking, how did transgressive, performative gesture lyricism play a role in punk women's reclamation of space during this time period, 75 to 83. How can the collision of absurdity, gloom, deviancy, et cetera, within musical perform performance contribute to empowerment? Curious to, as, to your reflections. That's a great question. Wow. Did you get all that? Yeah. And I mean, I, I would have to chew on that for a long time to have a really okay. good answer. But I think that what, what I'm thinking is just that people women especially were allowed to express themselves in a way that they hadn't been able to before and they could express themselves in whatever way they wanted to so like women could be hyper feminine if they wanted to be they could be more masculine if they wanted to be they could be androgynous they could be weird they could be performative they could be quiet poets like um they were just there was a lot of different ways that women could be that weren't um scripted for them yep Good answer. awesome yeah thank you and i've got another question here um i'm so glad you wrote this book jen having witnessed the transition of punk from come one come all community to an often white male-centric culture it is so important that women's early role is documented so i think that's more of a comment than a than a question yeah. thanks eleanor um if you want to well what i'll say is that a lot of the women that i talked to said the same thing um i penelope houston was the first person i interviewed i got to interview her in person because this was before the lockdown um which was really cool i happened to just be going to san francisco um so i got to talk to her in person and she you know that was a sentiment that she expressed a lot which was just that like she just didn't even feel comfortable in punk spaces after what like 81 or 82 and you know she moved on to doing kind of more like folk music and you know she liked the weirdness of punk she liked when it was artistic and fun and colorful and everyone looked different and then when it became just this you know uh yeah Hardcore. Uh, white yeah. male center culture she was just like i'm out bye and a lot a lot of women said that so this is a really good question, I think. Um, 
How can a woman musician be punk today? That is an interesting question. You know, I think when I was, when I first started my, my first, like, well, I've been in a lot of bands, but when I started uh, Swimsuit Edition and it was like an all women band, we had guys here and there, whatever in the band, I wasn't truly aware of a lot of the women that were playing punk in the 70s, 80s, like the women that I wrote the book about. I wasn't fully aware of them, um, which was which was kind of punk because I was just be I was just, you know, expressing myself however I wanted to. Um, but then a lot of people would just always be like, oh, you guys are like the Donna's or you're like the Go-Go's or like, they'd always, you guys are Sleater Kinney. Like you, they'd always have to like tie us to, uh, another band with women in it. And I think what was punk ab about how we responded was like, we were just like, we're not inspired by them. We're inspired by the wipers or like whatever. Um, but now I'm kind of like, it's, it's, it, it, I don't know. I don't even know if I'm answering this question now, but, um, I really, I think it is important to understand the history and that's why I wrote the book. I think that girls who are starting bands, it's, it is really cool and important for them to know about this history. But at the same time, just like, I think it's important to just do what you want to do and like blaze your own trail. <laughs> totally. Yep. And there's already been a call in the chat for you to write us a follow-up book. So okay. 80, 84 on. So we'll make oh, that happen. Yeah, you know what? Yeah. There's so much to cover in this time frame still. Yeah. That, I was going to say, oh, you could probably make another volume out of just. I don't know that I could frame. even move on from this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there's so, this so, okay. Speaking of which, to get the, the inevitable question, you mentioned earlier, narrowing it down from 100 to like 89. Uh, someone asked, is there someone that you really sort of regret having to, to leave? Is there one fan that you really regret having to leave out? There's a lot. I actually have them highlighted in different colors in a spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> the, the one, if I could have just made it 90, it would have been Wilma and the Wilbers from uh, Minneapolis. I just could not find any information on them. And like one of the band members' names is like a series of numbers. Oh my like, God, really? <laughs> like, I, you know, I just could not get any information on them. If anyone can help I've me with that. I've got that one single, but I... The, the other single I've never been able to track down, but it's great. I bring it out to DJ with all the time. They, yeah. That is a good one. Yeah. That's that's my one. And, you know, someone, people have been like, there's no bands from Minneapolis. I'm like, there is this one that I was, <laughs> I really wanted <laughs> to write about. Um, just couldn't find you get a chance to watch the, that last George and Tammy episode with the maggots? My Paramount Plus subscription is pretending like it doesn't uh. exist. I don't know. I tried to find a clip for it, but that's a kind of a cool pop culture moment that somewhat intersects with Jane Weems in your book is that the George and Tammy series, the very last episode, starts yeah. off with Let's Get Tammy Wynette. Pretty <laughs> amazing. Gave me goosebumps. That song is so like mean girl, but it's such a good song. It's incredible. Yeah. You got it. And especially just imagine like seeing a band play that too. Everybody would stop and turn around and be like, what in the hell is that? <laughs> So um, should we run through a couple of these last? Yeah, so that's all the questions that I saw in the chat. Thank you, everyone, so much for your engagement. It's been, the chat has been hopping the whole evening. It's been great. Um, I figure we'll just let you guys um, wrap it up however you wanted to and, and close us out here and end the evening. Thanks again so much for, Jen, your book's amazing. Um, I put a link in the chat. Check it out from your library. Get it from Quimby's. Whatever you got to do, get your hands on this book. And um We'll let you guys close it out however you want to. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thanks a lot, everybody. Do you want to um, run down those tracks or? Uh, yeah. You want to do okay. the 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 best saxophone based song? Yeah, we were talking. Jen and I had a little chat about what were the uh, <laughs> probably the the instruments that are usually most prevalent in the best uh, female punk tracks, and synthesizers and saxophones kind of stuck out. So yeah. then I decided to just come up with lists of the best tracks yeah. that were kind of in those saxophone and synthesizer uh, categories. Synthesizer yeah. seemed a little easier, so sax took the most work, and this is what we came up with. Yeah. Um, I think we should make a playlist of a lot of these songs. I didn't realize how many songs had saxophone, to be honest with you. Um, my favorites, I'll do my favorites, and then you you have a list, too. Um, Romeo Void, A Girl in Trouble um x-ray specs a day uh the uh, the day the world turned day glow um waitresses bruiseology like the title track of that that album mm -hmm. i i love that song so much um and then another one is kirsty and the husband sitting in a disco 
I don't know. That. Um, and then uh, I, you you gave me this uh, seven inch a while ago, the Silex pistols uh, by Silex too much pistols. Yeah, so good. <laughs> Sax attack. <laughs> I, I I think we need to make a playlist and we did. We should. Yeah. Um. The the weird ones that I kind of came up with as far as like the early stuff that I thought might be the hardest to figure out would be like uh, Yoko Ono sang sings a song called "We're All Water" off the. Uh, one day in new york album john and yoko from 72 that's amazing uh full of saxophone super like girl group meets dissonant noise uh time machine by the sadistic mika band from japan from 1974 incredible uh japanese proto-punk song with female lead vocals amazing stuff the rest of the album's terrible that song is <laughs> one of those weird situations uh saturday night stay at home by the suburban reptiles from new zealand Meet the Creeper by Destroy All Monsters, Between Borders by Neo Boys, Puppies in a Sack by Dancing Cigarettes. And there's another one I wish I included. That yeah, they're a weird one too from Indiana. Yeah. Uh and Unconventional Boy by Chicago's own Bohemia. Sorry, I want to say this one last thing. I just yeah. learned about like 10 bands with women in them from Indiana just today, like a half hour before we started this. Wow. wow. Um, yeah. Peter Aaron tagged me in something on Facebook and so, uh, DJ just did like a tribute to them. And some of the women in the bands are commenting on, on the post on Facebook. And I was like, there's like 10 bands from Indiana from this yeah. time. I was like, I, I didn't even, I don't have any bands from Indiana. Peter's great. Peter's a great source for finding that awesome stuff out. That's how actually I got to say the anemic boyfriends. Uh, the reason why we put that record out was because Peter Aaron posted an anemic boyfriend's track on Facebook. And I was like, wow, that band name sounds amazing. I looked <laughs> him up, but he didn't post, uh, the fake ID song. He posted a different track and I looked him up and then I was just like, wow. And then I basically was like, Peter, thank you so much after I tracked him down. But thanks to Peter Aaron, we did the, uh, anemic boyfriends reissue. Yeah. So Peter's yeah. great. Good awesome stuff, sure. thank thank you guys so much um if you make a playlist i will share it out with all the registrants if you guys want to do that that'd be a awesome. little bit extra work but we'd be happy to do that so oh, yeah. thanks everyone for coming thank you jen thanks for writing the book todd thank you so much for Absolutely. being on with us tonight and uh christina thanks for all your help along the way so thanks everyone we'll see you next time thanks, see you neil guys. Yeah. real really quick fun. guys yep. do you mind if i play the last song oh yeah, oh, yeah. the last song great great. An outro and then we'll perfect. end it and it's called right. Thanks Kids. I thought it was appropriate. All right. Oh, I right, it, right. Yeah. Perfect, we were going to yeah. play this yeah. one first, but it makes more sense now. All right, here we go. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone. Right. Thank Thanks you. Take care. Here. See you. Take care. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone.